Welcome to... Game Name Here. Hopefully you have already had a chance to enjoy the offbeat perspective and new game mechanic of Portal. To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your use key. To stop a commentary node, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press the use key again. Some commentary nodes may take control of the game in order to show something to you. In these cases, simply press your use key again to stop the commentary. Please let me know what you think after you've had a chance to play, as we think we are just at the beginning of taking advantage of this type of gameplay. I can be reached at gaben at valvesoftware.com. Thanks, and have fun! One of the things we learned from Narbacular Drop, our student project that became Portal, was that players often thought portals took them into other spaces, or even other dimensions. To help fight that notion, we start players in a visually unique room with memorable objects, so that when they walk through a portal for the first time, they have a clear point of reference which communicates the idea that they're still in the same basic location. For instance, the radio, which is playing an instrumental version of Still Alive, helps as well by providing some audio continuity. It's absolutely critical that players quickly wrap their heads around what a portal is. We noticed early playtesters grasped the concept much more quickly when they caught a glimpse of themselves through a portal. So we deliberately positioned this first portal to ensure that players will invariably see themselves. We put the player character in an orange jumpsuit to reinforce the fact that she's a test subject. Visually, the warmer colors helped her pop out against the colder tones of her environment. Some playtesters were wondering why she could fall so far without getting hurt the way she would have if she were in Half-Life 2. In response, we added a mechanized heel spring to her lower legs. Afterwards, there was no longer any question about why she could survive such long falls. These frosted glass observation rooms make the player feel as if they're being watched at all times while keeping the identity of these watchers a mystery. The rooms serve a practical purpose as well, since we often use them as convenient and logical light sources for the test chambers. Portal is effectively an extended player training exercise. We spend a huge portion of the game introducing a series of gameplay tools, then layering those tools into increasingly difficult puzzles. This layering starts here, where we train the button and box mechanic, before introducing the more complicated concept of portals. We wanted players to feel safe while standing in a portal, so we never kill them or destroy objects within a portal that's closing. Instead, we either push or teleport objects out of a portal as it closes. We very deliberately introduce and train each gameplay concept in Portal, so that once players reach this spot, we're confident that they know what a portal is and roughly how it works. Early versions of the game let players stumble through the beginning, without always understanding what was going on, which really compromised teaching new concepts. The puzzle you just finished was designed so that stumbling around will almost always lead to a dead end. Completing the puzzle requires walking through a minimum of five portals in a specific order. This kind of gating, in which a solid understanding of key gameplay concept is required for success, helps standardize the learning curve of the game tremendously. You are doing very well. Please be advised that a noticeable taste of blood is not part of any test protocol, but is an unintended side effect of the Aperture Science Material Emancipation Grip, which may, in semi-rare cases, emancipate dental fillings, crowns, tooth enamel, and teeth. In early versions of this map, playtesters would charge down the stairs without noticing what was creating the portals. We introduced a mandatory pause in the action, what we call a gate, to help ensure that players stop and notice the portal gun making the blue portal. The particle effect and a loud noise help draw their attention. Very good. 
Please proceed to the chamber lock. Mind the gap. This room was designed to make players understand that entrance and exit portals aren't tied to the color of the portal. Playtesters often assume that orange portals were exit only, so we created this puzzle to force players to enter an orange portal. When rendering the player's view through a portal, we must render a separate image using a virtual camera which looks out of the opposite portal. To obtain a correct image and efficient rendering performance, we render only what is visible through the limited field of view of the opposite portal and exclude objects which lie between the virtual camera and the plane of the opposite portal. The combination of portal destroying fields, which we call fizzlers, and the elevators serve a dual purpose. They provide a clearly identifiable endpoint for each test chamber while also addressing the more practical problem of how to keep players from portaling across level loads. We eventually integrated the fizzlers into several of our puzzle designs. Welcome to test chamber four. You're doing quite well. For training purposes, there's generally just one correct solution to these early puzzles. The original version of this room didn't have the glass barrier. Playtesters would often stand on the button to open the door and then shoot a blue portal through the opening, bypassing the box entirely. Since this puzzle was meant to illustrate the relationship between boxes and buttons, that solution, while clever, was a failure. So we added the glass barrier to prevent it. Later in the game, however, the puzzles become more open-ended. Integrating portals with Source Engine's physics system was a complex process that required several iterations to achieve the right balance of performance and correctness. Because portals can be placed virtually anywhere in the game's environment, the physics system had to be modified to allow dynamic changes to its representation of colliding geometry, such as the walls and floor around this box, and any objects which may lie on the opposite side of the portal. Initial implementations of this dynamic collision generation system could take up to one half of one second, or 500 milliseconds, to compute the correct collision. This may not sound like a long time in everyday life, but this pause during the portal creation was quite noticeable in the context of a game. Ultimately, we designed a system that creates temporary hybrid physics environments in bubbles around the portals, using less accurate collision than that produced by Source's standard collision generation, but was accurate enough in practice and reduced the time to create dynamic collision representation from 500 milliseconds to just 10 milliseconds, which is an imperceptible pause during portal creation. Early versions of Portal featured more detailed, cluttered environments, much like Half-Life 2. We quickly realized that unnecessary objects scattered all over the place distracted players to the point where it actually interfered with the Portal training process, so we simplified the art style to favor clean, focused test chambers. The modular approach we settled on makes it look plausible that the chambers can reform dynamically on these pistons. To make puzzles deeper than just teleporting to the exit, we had to include surfaces that won't hold a portal, which are formally introduced here. We experimented with several surface designs before we settled on this one, whose visual noise and reflectivity make it easy to identify at a distance. Originally, these scaffolds ran on electrified tracks, but crafty playtesters would hop along the rails to the exit, bypassing the puzzle entirely. We tried to solve this by killing players as soon as they touched the rails. That solution ended up being too much of an overcorrection, as even skilled playtesters were getting frustrated by these one-hit kills in the more complex puzzles later in the game. Making the scaffolds run along immaterial beams of light solved both problems. Please note that we have added a consequence for failure. Any contact with the chamber floor will result in an unsatisfactory mark on your official testing record, followed by death. Good luck! Even though layering player training was a design goal from the start, we still ended up introducing some concepts too quickly. For instance, this used to be the first energy ball redirection puzzle. Playtesting revealed that this puzzle introduced too many new concepts at once, which ended up frustrating a lot of playtesters. In response, we inserted two test chambers before this one to make the energy ball redirection training more gradual. 
We previously talked about how we handle static portal collision, but collision with moving objects on the other side of a portal is a completely different and equally hard problem. Walking onto this scaffold was a very iffy proposition for the first few months of development. We solved the problem of colliding with these dynamic objects by cloning the objects from one portal to the other and strictly controlling what objects are allowed to collide with each other and how they're allowed to collide. The Enrichment Center regrets to inform you that this next test is impossible. Make no attempt to solve it. For the first few months of development, we rendered the views through portals to two off-screen textures. This approach was easy to implement and was compatible with a wide range of graphics hardware. Unfortunately, this method was incompatible with anti-aliasing and consumed a large amount of video memory in order to handle recursive views through several portals. Because of these disadvantages, we switched to a system which renders portal views recursively into the frame buffer with the aid of the stencil buffer to isolate pixels corresponding to a given portal. This is a more effective scheme because it is compatible with anti-aliasing and does not consume any additional video memory for off-screen textures. Because our test chamber environments were simplified for training purposes, we created visual hotspots within the rooms to guide players' attention. The design is essentially a balance between round objects and sharp objects. The sharp objects representing background elements and the round objects, such as doors and movable props, comprising our points of visual interest. Hello again. To reiterate... Momentum. Portal momentum ended up being the hardest concept to convey. For this series of puzzles, which went through more design iterations than virtually any other part of the game, we introduced the idea of redirecting your momentum using portals slowly, step by step. We even have the AI voice pretty explicitly explain the elements of the puzzle, something we avoided throughout most of the rest of the game. Spectacular. You appear to understand how a portal affects forward momentum, or to be more precise, how it does not. Using gravity to fall into one portal so that you come rocketing out the other portal, a skill we call flinging, was another difficult concept to train. We designed a specific visual cue, a pushed out concrete block with checkerboard tile above a pit, to indicate to players that it's time to use the fling maneuver. Repeated several times, this cue helps players associate pushed out concrete slabs with flinging, in much the same way that players learn to associate cubes with buttons. Momentum, a function of mass and velocity, is conserved between portals. In layman's terms, speedy thing goes in, speedy thing comes out. Originally, these exit portal surfaces were static geometry in the final position, but playtesters stubbornly refused to look up to find them. This is another example of the classic game design problem of coaxing players to look up. By putting the portals on moving pistons, we were able to start them in a position that players were more likely to see. The Enrichment Center promises to always provide a safe testing environment. In dangerous testing environments, the Enrichment Center promises to always provide useful advice. For instance, the floor here will kill you. Try to avoid it. We found that rather than looking into portals to see where it went, playtesters would often leap blindly to their doom. In response to this observation, the moral of this puzzle is, look before you leap. The safe orange portal is out of the player's view from this balcony. That forces them to peer through a portal to see it, which trains players in their remote viewing capabilities of portals. Originally, a weighted button was used to open the far door, but playtesters so strongly associated boxes with buttons that they'd get stuck searching hopelessly for a box. We changed the big button to a pedestal-mounted push button, thus removing the box association. 
but playtesters still had trouble realizing they needed to shoot a portal through the door. Adding a ticking timer sound when the door was open cued players that the puzzle expected them to act during that time, which solved the problem. This room is designed to build anticipation for the big moment when players finally get the fully powered portal gun. The puzzle path brings you in a circle around the device, so that it's virtually always in sight, right up until you grab it. The device has been modified so that it can now manufacture two linked portals at once. As part of an optional test protocol, we are pleased to present an amusing fact. The device is now more valuable than the organs and combined incomes of everyone in... Subject phone call, here. Get to see there, fling yourself. Let fling into space. Player training doesn't always stick, especially after the introduction of a big new concept. For instance, after they had acquired the fully powered portal device, playtesters often forgot about the fling maneuver. Since it's such an important skill, this puzzle is designed to reintroduce the idea of flinging. When we moved from largely placeholder art to our final visual design, this was the first level to get a facelift. We chose this map because it had many of our gameplay elements integrated into a relatively small space. The test chamber art direction was designed to make everything appear purposefully placed. The simple design helps focus players on the puzzles. It also provides a nice contrast to the later, much less sterile behind the scenes environments, which contributes to a clear sense of progression. This is the first map in which we experimented with solving the puzzle in as few portal placements as possible. We tried to fit that concept into the story mode, but were never quite able to sell it. Instead of abandoning the idea altogether, we added the concept to a series of post-game challenge maps. A problem we came across with virtually any puzzle involving boxes and doors was that the players could portal the boxes to the other side of the door, thereby trapping themselves in a room with buttons but no boxes. We set up special triggers to detect and handle these cases, and then added the box delivery tubes to ensure players could always be supplied with the required tools. Despite the best efforts of the Enrichment Center staff to ensure the safe performance of all authorized activities, you have managed to ensnare yourself permanently inside this room. A complimentary escape hatch will open in three, two, one. A few playtesters put a portal on the floor here and used the rising stair pit to skip the rest of the puzzle. We'll usually rework a level if playtesters discover a way to bypass chunks of the puzzle too easily, but in this and a few other cases where skipping ahead arguably takes more skill than solving the puzzle properly, we let the ninja solution stand. This is a great spot to appreciate the recursive nature of portals. If you place a portal on each side of this hallway, you'll notice the portals seem to go on forever, similar to the effect you get in a hall of mirrors. In actuality, we support a maximum of 9 recursive portal views to any chain of portals. 
we achieve the impression of infinite recursion by copying part of the previously rendered frame onto the final portal in the recursive chain. It's not perfect, but it's inexpensive and effective. We designed this room to draw the player's eyes to the box. The light from the observation room casts horizontal shadows that point at the box, which is directly lit by a warm light from the ceiling. This warm light helps the box stand out against the predominantly cool test chamber lighting. The varying size squares of the off-limit surface also help direct the player's attention upward. The enrichment center is committed to the well-being of all participants. Cake and brief counseling will be available at the conclusion of the test. Thank you for helping us help you help us all. This particular section went through several iterations because it's the first place where players are required to perform possibly the trickiest portal maneuver, the double fling. Originally, the room also featured an energy ball redirection puzzle. Combined with a new double fling skill, however, it proved to be too much for most playtesters. Overwhelmed players tend to not digest new information, so we simplified the puzzle to require only the double fling. To nudge players in the right direction, we also included visual hints such as the previously introduced single fling theme, the pushed out concrete slab with a checkerboard landing zone. This puzzle requires players to redirect an energy ball through multiple portal placements. The multiple steps cause many early playtesters to panic and accidentally redirect a ball right into themselves, with deadly results. We redesigned the test chamber so that portals can only be placed in the top half of the room, which solved the problem by generally leaving players out of the ball's reach. We noticed through our playtest that many of our players weren't aware of the fact that you could place portals while falling. Since placing portals as you are falling is essential to accomplishing flings and many other portal tricks, we implemented this puzzle so that the only way to solve it was to use the mid-air placement tactic. It took numerous iterations and lots of tuning before this consistently played well. Perhaps the most important purpose of this final test chamber is to cement the double fling maneuver training. For previous flings, we employed a visual cue, a pushed out section of a wall. In preparation for the more freeform behind the scenes levels, however, we take the training wheels off. To proceed, players must realize they can double fling almost anywhere they want to, with or without hints. In this puzzle, we wanted players to realize that, using portals, they can travel long distances in a short step. Originally, we had stairs from the ground level to the upper rooms. Many playtesters, however, were able to run from one room to the other quickly enough to consider it a solution, without ever thinking to use the even easier portal method. By changing the stairs to very slow-moving lifts, we were able to level the travel time for all player experience levels, thus making the intended solution more clear. Mandatory scheduled maintenance, the appropriate chamber for this testing sequence is currently unavailable. It has been replaced with a live fire course designed for military androids. The Enrichment Center apologizes for the inconvenience and wishes you the best of luck. For Portal, we wanted to create a turret that was different from the traditional Half-Life 2 turrets. The Half-Life 2 turrets are nothing more than mindless mounted guns. In Portal, we wanted the turrets to have personality, to be characters. The so first step was a redesign of the look. Once we had the look of the new turrets, they seemed less like menacing machine guns and more like cute robots. And robots can never really be cute until they are talking robots. So the next step was creating the vocal characteristics of the turrets. 
Working with Ellen McLean, we settled on an innocent sounding voice with dialogue to match. This juxtaposition of killing machine and innocent non-aggressive personality ends up making the portal turret a memorable character. Even though we didn't want Portal to be too combat heavy, we wanted to add at least a light combat mechanic. After a few less than successful attempts to actually realize this light combat concept, we settled on turrets as a good compromise. The turrets can be defeated with tricky portal maneuvers, but they're also susceptible to a more straightforward berserker approach. Even though Portal tells a simple story, we created a lot of backstory for Aperture Science, for its employees, for its rivalry with the hated Black Mesa, and for where all of this fits into the cosmology of Half-Life. This first Portal game doesn't reveal all of it, but we crammed a lot of little details into the environments. This area, for instance, called the Ratman Den, hints that there may be other people trapped in the facility. Center once again reminds you that Android Hell is a real place where you will be sent at the first sign of defiance. The vital apparatus vent will deliver a weighted companion cube in three, two, one. This weighted companion cube will accompany you through the test chamber. Please take care of it. We designed this hall so that players had to use a box as a shield, but many playtesters read it as an avoid the energy ball timing puzzle and simply left the box behind. We solved this in large part by having the AI talk about the box. A lot. Once the dialogue went in, playtesters went from routinely abandoning the box to never wanting it to leave their side. Since we weren't going to make the players lug a box around for the rest of the game, we had a scene at the end of the level where the players are forced to kill the box. The symptoms most commonly produced by Enrichment Center testing are superstition, perceiving inanimate objects as alive, and hallucinations. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube will never threaten to stab you and, in fact, cannot speak. I know that I was told that, you know, sort of the idea of Valve is that everything, everything is planned. Everything is worked out in advance. But that's a big fat lie. Because the, the initial idea is started and they bring an actor into the studio and they say, you know, say these words for us. Say this computer generated voice for us. Okay, I'll do that. Well, then, then that gives the creators other ideas. And, it, and it's a rolling process. You roll from one idea into the next idea. The awful end of the companion cube serves a dual purpose. It adds a lot more sinister character to our already pretty sinister AI, while simultaneously training the player to use the incinerator, a key component of the final level. The training has a nice dramatic payoff, 
since players later get to avenge the death of their good friend the Companion Cube by stuffing some of the AI's important parts into exactly the same type of incinerator. You're kidding me. Testing cannot continue until your Companion Cube has been incinerated. Although the euthanizing process is remarkably painful, 8 out of 10 Aperture Science Engineers believe that the Companion Cube is most likely incapable of feeling much pain. The Companion Cube cannot continue through the testing. State and local statutory regulations prohibit it from simply remaining here, alone and companionless. You must euthanize it. Destroy your companion cube or the testing cannot continue. While it has been a faithful companion, your companion cube cannot accompany you through the rest of the test. If it could talk, and the enrichment center takes this opportunity to remind you that it cannot, it would tell you to go on without it because it would rather die in a fire than become a burden to you. You euthanized your faithful companion cube more quickly than any test subject on record. Congratulations. The experiment is nearing its conclusion. The enrichment center is required to remind you that you will be baked and then there will be cake. Creating the AI voice was a multi-step process. First, we ran every line of dialogue through an automatic text-to-speech program. In the studio, we cued the actress who plays Gladys, Ellen McLean, with the computer-generated sound file. She'd mimic it, and then over the course of several takes, adjust her performance to clean up any words that were unintelligible in the computer version. For instance, here's a line as Ellen delivered it. Perfect. Please move quickly to the chamber lock as the effects of prolonged exposure to the button are not part of this test. Once the recording was done, we processed all the dialogue to give it an extra computery edge. Here's that same line as it appears in the game, with the pitch constrained, pitch modulation suppressed, and the formant moved up. Perfect. Please move quickly to the chamber lock, as the effects of prolonged exposure to the button are not part of this test. As an actor, you know, you come in, you do what you're told, you want to make your money, and sometimes you get good direction and sometimes you don't get good direction. But it doesn't matter, and you certainly don't tell the production team any of this. But you come in and they'll, you know, they'll give you a, a lame line reading, and you're supposed to find some emotional value in that. But this is not what this team did. They would come in, for example, Explosively indignant. That's a wonderful direction for an actor. So, I must say that the production team won me over, because so often I get bogus direction, but this time I was actually directed and had fun at all the sessions. Welcome to the final test. When you are done, you will drop the device in the Equipment Recovery Annex. Enrichment Center regulations require both hands to be empty before any cake... We use these moving platforms to add time pressure to puzzles. A sequence of simple decisions feels much more climactic under time pressure, in contrast to most puzzles in Portal which can be solved at the player's leisure. Puzzles that aren't time-bound can be more complex, but at the expense of being less dramatic. Sometimes little details make a huge difference. For instance, we had to add the left side to this wall to give players a visual representation of how thick it is. 
Without it, playtesters frequently thought that the hall had just gotten impossibly narrower, panicked, and stopped making rational decisions. Congratulations. Congratulations. The test is now over. All aperture technologies remain safely operational up to 4,000 degrees Kelvin. Best assured that there is absolutely no chance of a dangerous equipment malfunction prior to your victory candescence. Thank you for participating in this Aperture Science computer-aided enrichment activity. Goodbye. Before the player escapes the fire pit, the AI dialogue is all delivered in a computerized monotone. After the escape, however, Gladys gets progressively more expressive until, by the end, she's cycling through a whole mess of emotions. The role required an actor capable of mimicking the computer-generated voice while still infusing it with some real character. Since we planned to end the game with a song, she also needed to have a good singing voice. The woman we ended up casting, Ellen McLean, is a great mimic, a terrific actor, Stop and a classically trained operatic soprano. So that worked out pretty good. We are pleased that you made it through the final challenge where we pretended we were going to murder you. We are very, very happy for your success. We are throwing a party in honor of your tremendous success. Place the device on the ground, then lie on your stomach with your arms at your sides. A party associate will arrive shortly to collect you for your party. Make no further attempt to leave the testing area. Assume the party escort submission position or you will miss the party. Thank you for assuming the party escort submission position. In these new areas, we weren't using the surfaces the player is familiar with. The rules for which new surfaces portals can be placed on, and which surfaces are off-limits, needed to be taught. So, we created this area both to show the player they've escaped into the guts of the facility, and to retrain them in which surfaces are valid for portal placement. I went to portals, uh, I, I googled portal in game, and I went to the trailer, and I just loved it. I loved hearing my voice. <laughs> and as I told the production team, I have never played a computer game in my life, but I want to play this one. <laughs> It was a fun test, and we're all impressed at how much you won. The test is over. Come back. After players escape, we let them solve an old chamber in a new way. This reintroduction of a familiar space, which can now be solved in an incorrect way, helps convey the sense that players are cheating the system while forging their own path through the facility. One bizarre fact of game design is that without some serious prompting, players will rarely look up. In this case, the prompt is the ladder. Most players will investigate where the ladder goes, which is up. The ladder actually falls apart as soon as it's touched, but by then it served its purpose. We designed the post-escape levels to give players brief glimpses of the inner workings of the Enrichment Center. This particular area exposes part of the storage cube distribution system. 
These little vignettes help make this section of the game visually distinct from the testing chambers, while reinforcing the idea that players are now behind the scenes. Through playtesting, we discovered that fatigue set in if we didn't break up the more complicated, deliberately paced puzzles with problems that required the player to perform a much simpler task under time pressure. These pistons proved to be a good foundation for that simpler type of puzzle. Because they feature a moving surface, they also gave us an opportunity to employ some unusual portal transitions, such as ceiling to ceiling. During development, we'd often run across some piece of level design that would break the portal system. For instance, this ceiling-to-ceiling -ceiling transition was an unexpected edge case that ended up requiring a lot of effort to make work. We tried never to take the easy route of simply changing the level design to work with existing portal technology. We knew that once the game was out in the wild, custom map creators would stress the system in ways we hadn't even considered, so we made it as flexible as possible. In the sound booth, you're only connected to the production team by an intercom, and they can talk about you, and you don't know what they're saying. But you trust that they're being kind. And, you know, they'll, they'll push a button, and then they'll say something to me. They'll say, a direction. No, that wasn't right. Do it again. Give us three more reads. And a lot of times what happens is they'll, they would play the computer-generated sound for me on one line, and then I'm supposed to recreate that three times with the director saying, okay, well, you know, more sarcastic or more angry or, or more irritated. So you stand in the booth hour after hour after hour. They're always very nice. They let you have water in here and maybe a pencil to take a few notes. And of course you want it to be interesting because you want them to hire you again. As the end of the game draws closer, we increase the ratio of time pressured puzzles, like this turret ambush, to give the players the sense that they're approaching a climactic encounter. An important design goal of these post-escape levels was to give players the sense that they're running wild inside the guts of the facility. With that in mind, we added plenty of nooks and crannies for players to crawl into or place portals through. This ended up being a tricky lighting challenge as the areas needed to be bright enough to navigate while still being dim enough to feel like obscure, disused sections of the building. Sarcasm. GLaDOS is sarcastic a lot. And that's so much fun. But while I was trying to do this, trying to build in all these emotions, I still had to maintain the computer sound and maintain uh, the pronunciation of repeated phrases. You know, aperture science and um, the enrichment center. These rocket sentries originally fired lasers. 
We switched from lasers to rockets after we introduced the glass breaking mechanic, mainly because glass shattering in a massive rocket explosion turned out to be a lot more satisfying than glass just slowly being melted by a laser. Originally they also spoke, just like the bullet turrets. Because players often redirect the rockets with their backs to the turret, however, a distinct uncluttered sound cue was required. The voice simply added too much noise to the rocket redirect mechanic. Breaking this tube gives players a chance to test out their newly trained rocket redirecting and glass breaking skills in a slightly different context, which helps cement the training. This massive turret ambush was originally a lot more massive, with turrets that dropped from the ceiling and popped out of surprise hatches. In fact, for a while, it was the game's climactic battle. Through playtesting, we learned that this type of pure combat experience didn't really fit with the preceding few hours of player training. Over several iterations, we toned down the combat and made the room more about using portal momentum to fling yourself great distances a skill that playtesters really enjoyed using, and that's a key component of what eventually became our final battle. Originally, these catwalks were decorative, but playtesters consistently thought they were significant and often spent a lot of time trying to reach them. We didn't want to stand between people and their desire to walk on the catwalks, so we redesigned the area to make catwalks not only accessible, but also necessary to proceed. Well, you found me. Congratulations. Was it worth it? The fiction behind this red phone is that while Gladys was being developed, it was somebody's job to sit by it. And if it ever looked like the AI was becoming sentient and godlike, that person would pick up the phone and call somebody to come help. In the point in time where the actual game takes place, it's become obvious that the Aperture Science red phone plan didn't 100% work out. So when they told me that there was going to be a song at the end, I thought, well, all right, who's going to write the song? And they told me there was going to be a song written by Jonathan Colton. And I listened to a song that Jonathan had written, and it, and it was very funny, very clever. So I thought at that point, well, you know, this will be okay. But I am an opera singer, so usually I sing, and I thought, well, will I be able to have the right style for the song? So I was concerned. But then before the recording, um, they sent me an MP3 file of the song, and I listened to it with Jonathan singing it, but I loved the little song. And uh, at home, as I practiced the little song, I tried to, you know, get back to GLaDOS's voice, you know, Aperture science. Aperture Just this science. tiny little passive-aggressive computer who's all alone until people try to come in and murder her. So of course she gets upset. 
But she seems she seems to have this real affinity for cake. And and I want to play the game because I want to recreate the cake recipe and then put portal on it and be able to serve it to my friends when they come over to my house. GLaDOS, the rogue disk operating system that now runs Aperture Science, went through a bunch of design iterations. Earlier versions included a floating brain, a sprawling spidery mechanism, and an upside down version of Botticelli's Rise of Venus built out of robot parts and wire. Eventually we settled on a huge mechanical device with a delicate robotic figure dangling out of it, which successfully conveys both GLaDOS's raw power and her femininity. Are you taking that thing? You're kidding me. Did you just set that Aperture Science thing we don't know what it does into an Aperture Science Emergency Intelligence Incinerator? It's the fluid catalytic cracking of it. It ensures for orphans. Nice job breaking it, heroes. This isn't brave. The difference between us is that I can feel pain. You don't even care, do you? Speaking of curiosity, you're curious about what happens after you die, right? Guess what? I know. You're going to find out firsthand before I finish explaining it, though, so I won't bother. When I'm gone, you, look, you're wasting your time. And believe me, you don't have a whole lot left to waste. What's your point, anyway? Survival? Well then, the last thing you want to do is hurt me. I have your brain scanner and power. <laughs> Things have changed. What's going? Back in here. I have an infinite capacity for knowledge. And even I am not sure what's going on outside. All I know is I'm the only thing standing between us and them. This was a triumph. I'm making a note here, huge success. It's hard to overstate my satisfaction. Aperture science. We do what we must because we can.
can. For the good of all of us, except the ones who are dead. But there's no sense crying over every mistake. You just keep on trying till you run out of cake. Then the science gets done and you make a neat plan for the people who are still alive. Black 